Good evening from India. Good afternoon to my friends in Europe and good morning to our colleagues and friends in North America and Canada and other parts of the world. It is my proud privilege to welcome all of you to the eighth thematic session of this conference on the theme evaluation and assessment of student performance in newer conditions. My name is Raj Kumar. I'm the founding vice chancellor of Open Regional Global University and your host. Uh, we have with us a very distinguished set of individuals, um, higher education leaders, thoughtful uh, researchers, as well as uh, institution builders who are part of this particular thematic session. I would like to first of all extend a warm welcome to my own colleague, Professor Dr. Samia Uma, Associate Professor of Jindal Global Law School, who will be moderating the session. We have with us Professor Dr. Zapata, Dean of the Faculty of Law, Universidad Extanda de Colombia uh, in Colombia. We have Professor Kenny Testi, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Law School Admission Council, former Dean of the University of Washington School of Law, United States. We have Professor Patricia Roberts, Dean of the School of Law, St. Mary's University, United States, and Professor Dr. Mehir Kanade, Academic Coordinator, Head of the Department of International Law, Director of uh, University of Peace Human Rights Center, University of Peace, Costa Rica. With those words, I would like to now hand this over to Professor Uma to take forward the proceedings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Rajkumar. And a welcome, a, a very warm welcome to all the panelists. I'm very happy to be here and to be um, moderating this session, uh, which focuses on uh, 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 evaluation and assessment of student performance in newer conditions. So. Um, just a few words uh, in terms of setting the uh, context and background before, uh, before we start off with the panel discussion itself. Um, this, uh, uh, if we look at legal education, uh, we know that it is not just about classroom lectures and discussions, but also about evaluation and assessment of student performance. We know that learning outcomes is something that we include into our um, curriculum, into our syllabus. And at the end of the um, semester, we look at whether those learning outcomes have been achieved. And the examinations or other forms of evaluation, we try to um, use that to test whether those learning outcomes have actually been achieved. Now, uh, tools and techniques employed for evaluation and assessment therefore become very critical. Uh, the traditional method of uh, evaluation has been sit down examinations and it's been widely used uh, for a very long time. But given the pandemic situation, um, uh, I, I'm sure even prior to the pandemic, there have been uh, movements away from the examination, formal examination systems and looking at other possible um, uh, methods of evaluation. But the pandemic uh, uh, context has intensified this and um, it has forced us to look beyond the conventional manners of uh, evaluation and assessment towards other forms. So what are these other forms and what have our experiences been like, um, our explorations maybe in the last, um, you know, eight to 10 months ever since the pandemic started, um, what have been uh, these experiences, these explorations, whether examinations, class, using class participation as a form of evaluation, online quiz, hypothetical questions, research papers, response essays, book reviews, online presentation, group discussion in the online mode. So I think there are many, many um, uh, types of evaluation that, um, that, that the law schools are uh, trying and uh, experimenting with. And in this panel, we would be very happy to hear your uh, ideas, hear your law school's experience, and to learn from your insights on what could be these more effective uh, methods of evaluation and assessment in legal education, given the uh, present pandemic context and beyond as well. So um, 
I would like to start with a, 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 a very basic question, uh, but um, it's something that would uh, take us, that would propel us to, um, to looking more deeply into uh, aspects of evaluation and assessment. So what is the importance of evaluation and assessment in legal education? And what is the role that it plays um, in the learning process of students? So that's the first question that I, I, I would like to um, ask. And um, uh, could I uh, have a Professor Patricia Roberts to start uh, uh, with a response in, uh, to this question, maybe in about uh, in a few minutes, and then we can move on to the other panelists as well. Thank you so much. And I just want to say what an honor it is to be part of such a robust conference that's going to help all of us learn how to improve legal education across the globe. Um, so the traditional forms of assessment are certainly used, as we all know, to measure the knowledge of the students, to see how far they've come towards our learning outcomes. Uh, it's also used, particularly in legal education, to um, see how they can transfer that knowledge to new scenarios, to utilize their new legal analysis skills um, and see how they're able to develop um, solutions to problems they've identified and considered in the context of the doctrinal learning. Um, in learning, uh, seeing how the students have reached their learning outcomes, students are offered the opportunity to see where they need to improve. They're given the opportunity to practice in timed examinations that they'll have to do in some licensing situations, uh, in particular for the bar exam in the United States. It helps to, the assessments help us also as uh, legal education institutions to see how effective the teaching methods are um, in a particular course or from an instructor and, and see where there's room for improvement there. Um, one of the things that it does do that I think uh, students find less um, or are less appreciative of is it ranks students. It ranks students in a way that external entities can see where a student um, performed and what their knowledge base is relative to their classmates. Um, that's a course important to external entities like employers. Um, so those are the reasons that uh, we have evaluation and assessment. And why I was excited to be on this particular panel is because um, we are moving away, I think, in the academy from just the summative assessment of final examinations or maybe midterm examinations and final exams. And the importance for that is because sometimes it doesn't just test the knowledge. Sometimes what it does is differentiate between students who are particularly good time test takers versus those who are able to show their knowledge in different ways. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Roberts. Uh, Professor Zapata, would you like to um, add um, your sure. insights to the question? Sure, thank you. And I always want to, I also want to say that uh, I'm very proud to be here, very honored in this uh, scenario, sharing with other colleagues from all over the world. I would like to share Colombian experiences and particularly the experience of our university. Yes. Of course, we assign a lot of important, importance uh, of, uh, to evaluation because it's the tool that allows a student to abstract concepts and create their own opinions and interpretation upon situations that require uh, value judgment in the daily basis as lawyers. As such, the evaluation guarantees that the graduate of the faculty performs adequately in professional practice. The role of evaluation is, in my opinion, twofold, to facilitate the development of a skill, and secondly, in the acquisition of information and transformation into knowledge. Therefore, the information is integrated into the learning process of the students. When scheduling the test, the professor must bear in mind that this, what are the skills that are so to develop. And in our case in Colombia, for the law school, we have defined five kinds of skills. Cognitive, communicative, contextual, evaluative, 
investigated. Mm -hmm. With these skills in mind, we must set the learning objective of the students and tell them what we hope they will obtain as a result of taking the exam. Our students do everything they do for a reason, to bring that knowledge into professional practice. This focus should define the content of the text. Thank you, Professor Zapata. Um, I would now uh, turn to uh, Professor Kanadi. Uh, as the pandemic has struck us, sit-down examinations have become quite uh, redundant. Uh, in your views and from uh, the experience of, of, um, your, of the law school that you are associated with in Costa Rica, uh, I'm wondering whether you would be able to share uh, with us how effective and successful um, have examinations been as a method of student evaluation? And how do you, what do you see to be the future of examinations in a post-pandemic world? as a tool of assessment. Thank you, Professor Soumya. Let me uh, join my colleagues on the panel in uh, thanking you for inviting us. Uh, this is an incredible endeavor, and it's just amazing what uh, a wonderful conference you all have, uh, have put through. Now, uh, regarding the question on sit-down examinations, um, I have, and to be very straightforward, I've never been particularly a big uh, fan of uh, sit-down, closed book, time-bound examinations. I think uh, they, it's time that they are redundant. They ought to have been redundant quite a long time ago. Um, I personally think that continued learning ex uh, experiences and evaluations are a better uh, format than sit down closed uh, book um, examinations. Um, in my experience and in the experience that we have at the, uh, at the uh, University for Peace uh, uh, Law Department, we have students from all around the world. And uh, many of the law schools do follow sit down examinations at the end of the term or midterm. Uh, we have realized that those only evaluate skills of memorization and the ability to um, respond and handle stress in a time bound manner. Yeah. Um, the problem with that that we have encountered is that students tend to gain the skills or believe that the more accurately they reproduce from a textbook, the more grades they will receive. And when they arrive to a place such as University for Peace, where um, they're expected to apply their minds, those skills of memorization and reproducing accurately from a textbook amount to plagiarism. Yeah. And that is one of the major issues that we always face at, uh, at the University for Peace. So I have always been um, a fan. If it has to be a sit down examination. Uh, it, it should be open book. Um, I believe that oral examinations sometimes are a very good idea as well. Mm -hmm. um, I also think uh, the other forms of take-home examinations, um, which are open book, practical case study based, problem solving based, uh, uh, research paper based exams, uh, quizzes are a better form of evaluation than uh, sit down, closed book, time bound examinations. Uh, on the last point about the COVID-19, uh, as I expressed earlier, I do feel that uh, you know, in the United Nations system, we have this uh, term that's now uh, being used rampantly. Uh, we need to build back better using the pandemic as an opportunity. Yeah. I think the same needs to be uh, replicated for education, particularly legal education. The pandemic is a wonderful opportunity to uh, infuse innovation, technology, rethink the uh, evaluation methods. Uh, and I think if we don't use this opportunity, it would be a wasted one. Thank you, Professor Kanade. Um, now I would move on to Professor Testi and just taking on from uh, what uh, Professor Kanade was saying about um, open book examinations. Now, would you think that open book examinations in some way, it, it kind of addresses the concern that we have about memorizing and reproducing and somewhere in an open book examination, we, uh, it could uh, it, it has the potential to test perhaps the application rather than merely um, reproducing or memorizing. So I'm just wondering in your own university, what has um, your experience been uh, in terms of open book examinations? Thank you very much, ma'am, for the question. And my uh, co-panelists, thank you for all the points you've already made, which are so strong around the value of assessment. 
I want to begin my remarks by first just giving a big congratulations to Dr. Raj Kumar and O.P. Jindal for an amazing conference. I'm proud to be a member of it. And I'm also proud as the president of the Law School Mission Council to be working now in India over a decade with all of you. Um, and, uh, and just thank everyone for the work they do to advance global legal education. I think the point that I want to make this morning about assessment and open book and how the pandemic has affected how our schools think about this is to remember that the science of educational measurement is in fact a field into itself. And as educators, we should be very conversant in that discipline. And one of the most important points about that is to remember that there is no one size fits all when it comes to assessment. One has to think about what is it I'm assessing and what's the right instrument that can accomplish that. And then evaluating whether in fact the instrument you're using is achieving its goals. For instance, we spend a lot of, uh, of our energy around the law school admission test and yeah. assessment that's yeah. not so much in the context of in law school, but prior. But it builds the three skills that are most fundamental to success in law school, reading, analysis, writing skills. Mm -hmm. And so we need to ask, what is our purpose and are we achieving it? And so I do believe that a variety of assessments, depending upon your goal, is what will most help accomplish the educational mission. Because assessment is part of learning, I believe. There's a great quote that says that every time you swim out to the rock, it gets a little closer. And I think that means that we need that application. It's not enough just to think about swimming or memorize how to swim. But in the doing, we also learn. And collapsing that distance between learning and assessment is so very important. Thank you, Professor Testi. Um, I, I think that's, an, that's a very um, um, important uh, idea that you're bringing about how we need to um, balance out between a variety of assessments and as well as um, the fact that it, it is not about one size fits all. So according to the course that we are teaching, according to um, the needs and the contents of that particular course, we would also need to look at various um, assessment uh, modes which are suitable to that. So um, just get, uh, the, this pandemic in that sense has really provided us uh, an opportunity to reimagine um, the forms of evaluation, such as exams, research papers, take home exams, quiz, and, and, and so on. Um, what reforms and innovations do you envisage in the legal education, uh, particularly in the area of assessment? And what role do you see academics like all of us play in facilitating uh, this particular evolution. So that's uh, the next question. Um, and I would like all the speakers to take a couple of minutes to, um, to, to talk about your own experience and insights on this issue. So perhaps we could go in the same order that we uh, started with. Uh, so we could start with Professor Roberts. Yes, thank you. Um, I love what Professor Kennedy said about build back better. And that's exactly what we need to do as far as assessments go. I took notes uh, to make sure I remember that to share with my faculty. I think we also can look to experiential learning courses for some of the inspiration for how we might change assessment and make it more creative um, to test not only a variety of skills, but do so in a manner of ways. Um, in experiential learning and clinics, which is where my background is, you know, students create legal documents, they perform oral advocacy in motions and hearings, they do in interviews and negotiations. All of these things are not just skill building, they are also incorporation of doctrinal teaching into those skills, which helps them reinforce the doctrinal learning while also exercising the skills. So having more skill-based activities um, incorporating that substantive learning, um, not only in the experiential courses, but also in doctrinal courses, introducing some of that in. Um, 
That offers students an opportunity to present a portfolio of work and an instructor to evaluate on a, a, a wide range of activities and, um, and opportunities for the student to share their knowledge. We have done so at St. Mary's in our legal communication analysis and professionalism program. And one of the things about the, uh, the various activities in which students are assessed is that they're done in context. Um, so for instance, for instance, they interview the client before they incorporate the information they learned in the client interview into a final memo. Um, when they're doing research for uh, a problem that is uh, intended to be utilized to brief a senior attorney, they do so for real San Antonio lawyers in the community um, who come in and listen to them uh, brief the, the research issue. By incorporating these kinds of simulations into the learning, um, the instructors are able to co uh, cover topics like oral communication, cultural competency, empathy, implicit bias, and questioning techniques. Um, that way it goes beyond the traditional legal writing curriculum. Mm -hmm. Another way that they do this is um, before the students even start, they're asked to read a book uh, this year it was on immigration issues, mm -hmm. uh, a memoir of sorts, and then they utilize what they've learned there to address an immigration problem all year long. So again, they're doing it in context. Um, I mentioned the senior partner meeting with uh, real, learning, uh, real attorneys in the community as part of their spring semester. Um, and afterwards, they prepare an appellate brief based on that same problem and engage in a mock argument. So all of this assessment takes place in the context of one particular fact scenario and allows them to draw on all that they're learning in their doctrinal courses as well as in the uh, lawyering skills course. Thank you, Professor Roberts. Uh, Professor Zapata. Thank you. I, I envisage innovation in legal education uh, as uh, based on case study, mood courts, and other kind of learning by doing. Mm. But I think it's not new. Mm. What is new is that they will be used more frequently. Mm. The evaluation process does not end with the grading of the test and the communication of the result to the student, student but with the feedback that must be given in each case. When the test has concluded, in some cases, the teacher remained with the students in the classroom to answer the questionnaire, or if they just send the document and then they send them back with uh, remarks on where the mistakes were. But feedback does not limit its effect to students, it's necessary, it, it also gave, bring information to the professor. Mm. The evolution of test and feedback is a necessity, therefore a constant in education. But the current situation has facilitated the process of change mm. and has allowed us to see the possibilities of our ability to adapt and evolve. Academics have facilitated this change and will be the ones to continue the same path. We have softened the paradigm that, that lawyers are conservative and reluctant to change. Yeah. But also, I think that we will be governed by a term which is diversify, diversification. The future of examination after the pandemic as a tool of assessment will be diversified as it has been during the pandemic. Diversification has been presented as a response to the challenges of going virtual. Professors have integrated online questionnaires, for example, hmm. with group of assignments, among others, into their catalog of tests. 
as they have left their comfort zone. The traditional methods of open questions, written or oral exams have not been left aside, but undoubtedly the catalog is now more diverse. It is important not to lose sight with the new evaluation methods because it's always better to focus on the mental process followed by the student than the result of that that has been reached. For example, in some cases, a professor asked the student, in addition to answering a questionnaire, that they base their answers on a separate document. Accordingly, in my opinion, some aspects must be taken into account in order to incorporate new tests uh, with the uh, following characteristics. First of all, the degree of interest and positive attitude of the students towards the new instrument. Secondly, the ability of the test to strengthen the skills defined for the law students. Third, the ability of the test, the advantages of the proof to serve as a learning instrument. And finally, if the examination demonstrates the reasoning process followed by the student. So I think in the future, we will diversify, but we have to be, uh, to look very close of what we are incorporating as new tools. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Zapata. Uh, I think there are very interesting um, ideas that, that uh, uh, both of you, Professor Roberts, as well as Professor Zapata, have um, mentioned. Um, uh, one is about uh, in doctrinal uh, courses, how do you introduce aspects of clinical legal education? How do you bring in experiential um, aspects? How do you bring in uh, skill-based activities into doctrinal courses. And uh, on the other hand, how do we use moot courts? How do we use case studies? How do we diversify in that sense uh, as well? I'm, uh, I, I would like to uh, take this discussion um, uh, uh, forward with uh, Professor, uh, uh, Professor Kanade and then with Professor Testi as to how do you see the role of academics in this uh, entire endeavor? Professor Kanadi? Thank you for that question. Um, I'd like to actually pick up on uh, a point that Professor Testi made earlier about uh, identifying what the role of evaluations is uh, and then uh, you know, devising all these uh, approaches towards um, the mechanisms for evaluation. I think that is fundamental. Um, Evaluations, to my mind, are not an end in itself. They are a means to an end. Mm. And ultimately, we are talking about ensuring whether students have realized and achieved the learning outcomes mm. uh, that we have set out to uh, at the beginning or while even deciding the pedagogy uh, of, 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 the, uh, of the course. Um, ultimately, I think as educators, we have to um, wonder and think about whether evaluations should be about punishing bad performance or whether it should be about ensuring the, uh, that students uh, gain the learning outcomes and improve uh, from such uh, evaluations. Um, uh, therefore, I think there's a, there's a more instrumental role uh, for the uh, academics to play in, in all of this. Now, regarding the doctrinal courses, I've always felt that such courses should not be about indoctrination of students. <laughs> Uh, we are not attempting to create robotic or formulaic uh, lawyers. Um, I've always felt that students need to be thinking lawyers once they emerge from law, law school. They need to situate legal education in the broader context of what the role of lawyers is uh, in the society. Uh, and this involves and requires critical thinking. It requires questioning the doctrines. It, question, uh, it requires problematizing. Uh, the doctrines and um, you know thinking about the role of law, uh, lawyers, judges, the legal system in general in moving the uh, society forward. And what I'm really hinting at here is uh, in doctrinal courses also uh, educators ought not to look at or teach students what, what law is. That is of course a very important part of it, but also what law ought to be. 
a lot of reformist movements are very important uh, in, in legal education. Uh, so in terms of role of educators, I think imbibing that within ourselves is, is quite fundamental to my mind. Can I have uh, Professor Testi? Yes, thank you very much. And I agree absolutely with what the professors just shared. Um, I think when we're teaching law, what we're really doing is helping our students grow into effective, complex problem solvers. That we, it isn't really about what is the law at this minute because the law may change, but we need to be able to make sure that everyone who's growing in their ability to use law can solve complex problems for clients, for society. And so I think the pr professor captured that very well in his remarks. I would add this, when I think about learning and assessment, I think of a very delicate dance between the teacher and the learner and that the learning is going both ways. So the teacher's learning as well. Yes. And I think that's very yeah. critical because for me, when I think about assessment, the way that you build them and the way that you use them, they're, they're communicative devices. They communicate to the learner where the learner is in their progression so that they help the learner from where they begin to where they end up in growing in their mastery. So they communicate important messages to the learner. But equally important is that the assessment also communicates to the teacher because assessment today means this is how I modify my instruction tomorrow. Yeah. And it helps me know where are my students how do I now tweak that learning process so that I meet the student where they are and help them advance as, as much as they can? And I believe, ma'am, that they can do that. You, we can all do that no matter the kind of course. I used to teach contract law to a room of 100 and, and large classes. But even there, and now today with technology, it's easy to work in segments that are focused on experiential, to have the student do something that's performative. Um, this last semester, for instance, when the pandemic hit, I was teaching law and leadership at, uh, at Villanova Law School. And uh, I had an exercise, for instance, where my students recorded a, an example of them giving a crisis communication speech. And then I was able to review those and give each student feedback on that and talk with them about it. So there are many ways that we can inject the experiential into large classes as well. But I think the key is remembering that it's always about what does that assessment communicate for the student and equally important, what does it communicate for the teacher? Yeah. Thank you. I would also like to um, share some of my own experience with, um, you know, uh, bringing in these skill based uh, elements. Uh, for example, I teach uh, family law and um, where it's related to property law within the family and inheritance and succession. Um, you know, uh, one of the uh, exercises which I also use for assessments is on drafting a simple will. And similarly, um, in, um, uh, uh, when I teach divorce, um, drafting a simple mutual consent um, divorce petition. So, uh, and these are very popular with students and they are happy to, you know, we rarely have students who are very happy about assignments and assessments particularly. But when we give these kind of um, uh, uh, exercises and uh, activities, uh, somehow there seems to be a little more um, enthusiasm uh, and eagerness to uh, to do this. I would just like to uh, take this um, a little further and think about the clinical courses. And I would really be, I, I'm curious to know what has been your experience uh, with uh, assessments in clinical courses, particularly during this pandemic. Um, of course, clinical courses also are of many kinds, where it is about drafting documents and building those kind of skills. I think in the online mode, that is probably uh, still possible, 
but uh, where there are clinical courses that require students to, for example, go to a particular underprivileged community, speak to the members there, understand the problems, and then um, uh, you know explore ways in which a, a, a law that they have learned can be applied to that very local uh, problem. Um, in India, for example, given the digital divide, it is it has been quite a challenge um, to do those kind of clinical programs and uh, to to conduct assessments in those programs has been even more difficult given the pandemic situation, the lockdown, um, the the lack of accessibility, and so on. So, uh, so it would be uh, great to um, understand what the experience has been with clinical uh, courses and assessments in them from, from each of you. So, uh, Professor Roberts? Yes, thank you. Um, I think the, the most important point you brought up that we haven't talked about yet is the digital divide. Yes. Um, certainly, most of the clients that our clinics are helping, uh, no matter where they are in the world, are those who cannot afford counsel on their own. Yes. And as a result, uh, they are also likely to not have the same access to technology, or if they have the same access to technology, um, they may not have it consistently or in, at the same time as our students and professors would. Um, but the digital divide goes even further, I think, when we're talking about assessments and online um, uh, assessments in particular, and that is there's a digital divide with our students as well. And so when we are um, determining how the assessments are to be given, we must consider that there is the student living in a multi-generational household who has no private room to take an exam or who has no uh, you know, it, consistent Wi-Fi or any Wi-Fi at all. Um, so that has to be part of our conversation is uh, to make sure that we level the playing field for students and also in clinical situations for clients. Um, I think that there are many things that if we take away the digital divide, if, there's, if there are opportunities for our clients to in fact um, access the internet and engage that way with our clinic students and faculty, there are many things that can be replicated almost as effectively as in person. Um, you can certainly do an interview this way. You can certainly argue a motion in front of a judge. In fact, lawyers across the world are doing just yes. that. Um, but the things that then I ha you have to make sure of as a clinician is that you are reflecting on what it is that's happened and what you might not have seen or what conclusions you might be drawing from um, a medium that doesn't allow you to look at body language and assess that or completely assess credibility. Um, uh, it takes additional energy to keep your, your viewer or your client engaged and, uh, or your uh, judicial um, officer, you know, um, accessing the, the documents you want in, in the right manner uh, so that they're most persuasive. The other piece I think that you have to think about when you're doing the kinds of things like client interviews over um, Zoom is that there's an ethics component too. Um, we have to make sure that when you're doing that interview, there's no one else in the room with the student, uh, that the only people on the platform are the professor and the student. Um, and that takes on a profound importance um, when you're not in the same room with the student and you can't control the surroundings that way. Um, Let's see, having uh, in clinical education, we do a lot of work in teams. Mm -hmm. That's harder to do over this kind of a platform, even though there are breakout rooms, it's just a little bit more challenging. Um, so while I, I think that it, it is the skills that need to be assessed and practiced um, in clinical education are quite transferable to this medium, it is not ideal. Um, because of the digital divide, because of the one dimensional nature of this type of uh, interaction and, um, and because of the potential ethical implications. Um. Thank you, Professor Roberts. The, uh, the message I, I uh, take from your, um, your intervention just now is um, about leveling the 
uh, playing field. And how exactly do we do that is, uh, and what has been the experience, um, uh, Professor Zapata, uh, in your context about okay. leveling the playing field with regard to assessments? Yes, we, we had the opportunity to, to think a lot about it. At the time of the pandemic, when we were starting, we have expressly incorporated a concept, the concept of flexibility. And we spread that concept to all the faculty, meaning that the professor should always try to understand the precarious situation in which the students may find themselves. Personal and family difficulties, in short, all those things that derive from the current situation. We also apply the concept of flexibility when practicing the exams, either by accepting rescheduling those who experience technical, economical, or health difficulties, or by limiting the scope of the subject to be examined. Our degree is annual, but in general, we have given professors freedom to apply this principle guided by another principle, which is that of academic freedom. So flexibility is a way just to level the, the field for all the students. Thank you. Um, could I take this uh, question uh, forward to Professor Kanade? And of course, flexibility, leveling the playing field, Lots of empathy, I, I guess, because uh, so many students are going through also very, very difficult situations at home. A family member is unwell. They themselves become unwell. Um, even if they are physically fine, uh, there's a lot of anxiety. There is, um, you know, a sub amount of uh, depression sometimes uh, and a sense of uh, isolation as well because they are not there together with their uh, classmates or, or uh, you know, have, so they are uh, also uh, in these isolated spaces because of um, mobility being restricted. So given all of this, how exactly, how, how much of this do we factor into the uh, manner in which we execute the assessments? So, Professor Kanade? I think we have to factor it entirely. Uh, mm -hmm. I agree uh, completely with uh, what uh, Professor Zapata has uh, identified as the guiding principles. Mm. Uh, in, uh, in the pandemic, and I, and I imagine for at least a year or so after, after the pandemic as well, um, which is flexibility and which is academic freedom. I think these are fundamental in, yeah. in, uh, in creating an enabling environment for professors to be empathetic. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not always possible to be empathetic if there is no enabling environment. Yeah. And I think universities need to, um, you know, assure that flexibility and academic freedom to professors and students would not be uh, looked down upon. Um, I think, you know, in, in our context at the University for Peace, we are very unique in the sense that uh, it's a United Nations uh, university. Uh, we have students from all 80 countries, uh, one third of whom are on campus and the majority are in the individual countries across different time zones uh, in different parts of the world. So we have had to adopt a blended learning format, uh, neither online fully ni nor fully face-to-face. -face. Uh, we are live streaming our face-to-face -face classes. Uh, we have the technology to ensure that all students online are participating in that. Uh, and of course, this means that we have to be extremely flexible. Mm -hmm. Some students, um, you know, when it's uh, those students joining from Asia, for instance, or Australia, mm -hmm. are doing so at 1 a.m. Uh, their time. And so sometimes it's just inhumane to expect them to be able to do that. Yeah. Uh, so we have had to adapt and be flexible with synchronous, asynchronous models of teaching. Yeah. Sometimes individual, uh, you know, work with the uh, students concerned, modifying evaluations and uh, for, for students, those who cannot do it synchronously, they can do a recorded presentation, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, utilizing learning management systems uh, such as Blackboard, Moodle, etc. Uh, for discussion question forums, uh, you know, uh, all of those are very important uh, tools. But I just want to flag one point. I, I don't know if the fellow panelists have encountered this. 
Um, we have seen during the pandemic an increasing amount of students being stressed, yes. uh, needing psychological support, which also means that educators have to double up sometimes, even if not fully trained as, as counselors and as uh, many psychologists um, to, to help support them. Uh, and of course, there's a limit to how much educators can do so because we are not fully trained and we, we need to ensure it doesn't turn out to be counterproductive. But this all again to point out that flexibility is absolutely key. Uh, and it is upon university leadership to, to, to guarantee to the uh, professors and students that flexibility would, be, would not be looked down upon or would not be a hindrance to, to evaluation and education. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Kanade. Um, we now have around 15 minutes uh, and there are five questions that have come in. Uh, so I thought that since um, in this round, um, you know, uh, maybe we could start with Professor Testi and I could pose uh, one of the questions to her and, and then we will uh, try to um, uh, take up a few more questions uh, that, that are coming in. Uh, so this question reads as follows. Several universities follow a cumulative assessment criterion and continue to follow the practice even when the teaching is mostly online. Will this remain as effective as it were during pre-COVID times or is there a need to rethink this specific criterion of assessment? Professor Testi. Thank you so much. Um, it's a very good question and I, I believe strongly that we should be rethinking everything from what we've learned through this pandemic. Uh, picking up on a theme from the prior question and answering this as well, yeah. I, I believe that the pandemic has accelerated uh, what I would call whole person education. And I think that, you know, as terrible as the pandemic has been, learning good lessons from it is, is obviously something we all want to do. And I think what it has done is helped make us all see that our students come to us not just in their, as learners in their minds, but as whole people with spirits and lives and families and, and, and differing levels of mental health and need for resources, uh, accommodations, et cetera. And I hope that post pandemic, we continue to see our students as whole people and help see the needs they, they may have in order to be the learners that they can be. And so I think in this particular question, we would need to uh, adjust. Um, we also need to make sure that we don't over rely on the pandemic to say, well, then that means we don't do any assessments. You know, everybody's fragile, so don't do anything. We still need learning, we still need assessment, the students still deserve our commitment to their learning and assessment is part of that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I now have a question which I, will, um, which I will pose to all the panelists. So any of you uh, would like to respond to it, you could please go ahead. Uh, during the pandemic, and this is a very interesting question, during the pandemic wherein the teaching is completely um, online across almost all universities, how can a student's classroom performance be assessed given that the setup of traditional classroom does not exist anymore? Who would like to, uh, which, I'm, I'm, I'm posing this to Professor Zapata? Yes, I, I was thinking about an, for an answer, an adequate answer for this tough question, because this is something that really, that really is difficult to achieve. Yes. I mean, we can, we can, as faculties, we can assure the quality of the education that has been given to the, to the students, but we can assure the conditions of the students at their, at their homes. Yes. For example, normally we, are, we, we don't want the students to be disturbed. But in this case, we have to accept that they will be the story yeah. because sometimes they share the same table, sometimes they share uh, the same room with others at the family. So we cannot prevent people for, 
uh, for having others aside or mm. share facilities, etc. So it's difficult to, to guarantee that. But what will be comp a compensation of this, of this uh, situation will be to increase another or to improve another kind of assessment. For example, or working in groups or having special sessions with teachers, for, with professors, etc. We should compensate what we cannot arrange. That's mm -hmm. my view on that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I myself tried um, uh, to introduce group discussion online uh, in the online mode. I tried to introduce group discussion as a method of assessment uh, in this semester. And um, at the last minute, the students were so anxious because there were issues of connectivity. There were issues of even, you know, not only Wi-Fi connectivity, but even uh, electricity related um, issues. And they weren't sure that they would actually be able to all of them uh, in the group would be there together. Uh, in the online platform to have that group discussion. And finally, I, I decided that it's just uh, giving too much anxiety to the students. And I, um, you know, I changed the mode of assessment to something else. Professor Kanade, what has been, have you tried as well? Yeah, I must say that we haven't had uh, as many issues with, uh, with the digital divide uh, at, at UPs. Uh, and I mean, it sounds strange because uh, so many students uh, come from so many different parts of the world um, and they ought to be, but fortunately there haven't be, uh, been as many uh, issues related to electricity or connectivity. Um, I, I think that in general, you know, using tools of breakout rooms or polls on Zoom or other platforms are very helpful. Uh, but I would highly, in my own experience, I've found uh, Moodle-based or Blackboard-based discussion forums which are asynchronous uh, and give students enough time to respond to questions or problems uh, are extremely helpful. And I say this because in a, in a live class, uh, many times students raise their hands and ask a question without having had the time to process enough or having done their own individual research. When they're typing in a response to a discussion question in an asynchronous fashion, they have done their research. They've thought about it because they have to articulate what they have to write. Yeah. And my experience has been that those sorts of forums make for much more advanced and higher informed uh, learning experiences for students. But this, of course, requires adaptability by professors uh, as well. And, you know, it's not always a given that uh, professors are ready to embrace uh, technology uh, mm -hmm. as much as uh, some of the others are. Yeah, actually, in in um, in uh, Jindal University, we all went through a course, um, uh, you know, in Coursera, so that we could actually grasp the tools and learn to uh, use the online uh, platform for teaching. Um, I'm wondering whether there is time. It's eight fifty three. One last question, maybe a few. Okay, you have another eight, eight. You have another eight, nine minutes, Samia. Don't yes, worry. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, because there are very interesting questions coming in, so I would really like to take advantage of uh, our esteemed panelists here. So one question that has come in is um, considering the welcome feedback in favor of uh, online modes of assessment, will law schools around the world consider keeping it once things are back to normal? Um, Professor Roberts, what would be your views on this issue? I'm starting to give this a lot of thought um, because I do think that there are tremendous advantages to online uh, assessment. So long as you can resolve the, uh, the digital divide issues, all students have equal access to the technology. Uh, the problem that we're finding is um, ensuring the integrity of the examination process. And mm -hmm. so there are softwares out there, as you all well know, that use video, um, you know, observation in, in order to ensure integrity. 
Um, there are problems with that, I think, because they're invasive of students' privacy. Um, also, I recently read an article that there are some students of color who are not identified um, with the, the, uh, the cameras, so that creates a, a problem um, right there and is discriminatory or could be discriminatory and stress uh, raising in general. Um, but I think that the pandemic has given us an opportunity and software companies an opportunity to consider how we might do better uh, as far as ensuring that integrity of examinations in an online manner. Um, and I hope in a way that will be less invasive moving forward. Uh, I also think, you know, uh, one of the, the, we've talked about assessments and grading and things like that. And one of the things that might be helpful is legal education looking at the value of letter grades and mandatory curves. Um, I, I say that because the, uh, the integrity issue is much more profound when there is so much at risk. Um, employment opportunities, salary opportunities, scholarship opportunities, all of these things related to grades and curves. Um, and while I, I don't suggest, um, you know, everyone going pass fail uh, would work in every instance, I do think it's worth a discussion for what sorts of assessments could be a, in different gradients of pass fail so that you remove the incentives for students to cut corners um, in order to obtain an advantage within that system. Thank you. I think we have had a, a range of issues and range of insights that have um, come in uh, in this panel discussion. Um, so I may have with your permission, I want to ask one question sure, before you sure. wind up. Sure. Uh, this question is for Kelly. Uh, Kelly, you know, unlike others who are sitting in this uh, discussion who are heading institutions, you of course head LSAC. And there are a whole range of issues relating to entrance examinations that are being confronted around the world, including India. Uh, we have been a long time user of the LSAT uh, India, and this time we did something quite extraordinary, uh, largely due to your leadership in which we moved the LSAT India, uh, what used to be all these uh, years in the past, uh, paper, pencil, sit down uh, on center examination into an entirely artificial intelligence remote uh, enabled remote proctored examination and successfully did it. Now, do you see this as the future in which the entire framework of brick and mortar centers of examinations can become a relic of the past? And this is the future of LSAT? Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Um, I do think that going forward, we're going to see uh, a lot more use of the remote delivery methodology. Um, we have been using that in the United States and obviously, as you noted, in India now during this pandemic, and it's working very well. It, as some of the panelists noted, it's really important to make sure that you're doing it right. And there are ways to make sure you're not invading privacy and that you're giving the student a very good experience, um, especially in a high stakes exam like the LSAT is, it's very critical that that be done. So I do think this is a methodology that's here to stay. I would not say that it's going to be the only choice and in part because of that digital divide. Uh, we have been providing um, loaner devices to students that need them, but it is something that going forward on a larger scale, we, we may need to make sure that for people who don't have their own devices, that there is access provided. Um, and, you know, I think a lot about technology, like I, you know, it's very similar to the food scarcity. It's not that there isn't enough food or technology, it's that it's improperly allocated. And so we have to think about how to make sure that everyone has access. But uh, we've been very pleased, uh, Raj, with the developments and see them continuing to accelerate. Thank you very much, Kelly, for that. Thank you. So I think it's time to uh, wind up. We are uh, at 8.59. Uh, and I have strict instructions to wind up by 9 o'clock. So uh, just to recap, uh, in 30 seconds, I think uh, we have had a very enriching discussion here, starting from objectives of evaluation themselves, 
to how do we maintain integrity of uh, assessments, um, leveling the playing field for uh, the students, emphasis on flexibility and um, emphasis on academic freedom so that each of us could reach out to the students and, uh, you know, with empathy, given the very uh, difficult, challenging situation that many students are facing, building back better is perhaps a way in which we could uh, move forward. And of course, the clinical elements, how do we work, bring in uh, the clinical aspects into assessments and also the challenges faced in uh, assessing in clinical programs uh, during these uh, this pandemic times. So thank you very much. I'm uh, leaving this uh, panel much more enriched and invigorated by all the thoughts and um, experiences that each of you have shared. So Professor Kanade, Professor Roberts, Professor Zapata, Professor Testi, thank you very much. And thank you, Professor Rajkumar, for this fantastic opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Uma, for a fascinating uh, moderation and uh, taking us all through this discussion. I really appreciate the presence of Professor Zapata, Professor Mehir Kanade, Professor Roberts, and of course, uh, Professor Testi. Uh, thank you for being part of this conversation, but more importantly, to share your thoughts and reflections, all of which will inform our own uh, ideas and perspectives about the future. I look forward to hosting you in India at better times. Until then, be safe. <laughs>